morning, and thank you for joining us, both to those of us in the room and to those of us joining us online. My name is Judy Kestrup. I'm the president of Eurace, uh, and I'm also the head of policy and thought leadership at Bilux. Eurace is a European alliance of uh, companies for energy efficiency in buildings, and we've organized this session together with the Architects Council of Europe and EAE um, ETICS. This session is called Leading the Way, a vision for buildings in the EU's clean energy transition. Now, there's no question mark after leading the way because we're not discussing if buildings are at the core of a climate neutral economy. We're discussing how to go about this starring role. Um, to that, we will look at buildings from a variety of perspectives, energy efficiency, flexibility, and sustainability, to name but a few. We'll do our very best to ensure we've got a lively discussion here, one that's engaging and thought provoking. And to really stack the odds in our favor, we've made sure we've got an excellent panel of speakers here. But the great thing about Yousef, of course, is that it gathers all the sharpest minds uh, on energy, energy efficiency, sustainability here on stage, but also amongst you in the audience. And that's also why we'd like you to chip in throughout this session with your questions that you can ask on Slido and your thoughts on this opening question. So imagine that we're in 2050 and we've achieved a goal of having a highly energy efficient, smart, sustainable and healthy building stock. What benefits will society and the environment derive from that? And if you aren't already asked you to please go in Slido, you can uh, uh, check the uh, QR code here and put in your answer in one or two words. And then we'll have a word cloud representing all your views. So go ahead, please. Okay, so someone's typing something. Three. Okay, so we got comfort coming up twice, consumer comfort and comfort, uh, clean air, resilience, productivity, high quality of life, climate adaptation, We'll give you a couple of more minutes to do this. There are no wrong answers. So I think if you want to sum up what we've got so far, there are basically three overall buckets. There's one about sort of adapting to a changing climate, so climate adaptation, uh, resilience, um, even survival. Uh, somebody's very cheerful here from the morning. Um, <laughs> there was one around um, the, the actual products, so something about intelligent control, for instance. Um, and then there's a big bucket around uh, basically uh, what can be summed up as comfort and happiness. So consumer comfort, uh, productivity, higher quality of life, um, value, sustainable. So I think what you're summarizing here is also what we want to talk about. It's a fact that to make sure that we decarbonize our building stock will lead to a, a host of benefits. And uh, I think the one we talk about mostly at the moment is around sort of energy consumption and around sort of climate adaptation. But actually a key reason for doing this is all, the, all these sort of multiple benefits, um, including comfort. And one thing that's clear to Eurace and to me is that to deliver these benefits, we need to work closely together between public and private stakeholders. Um, and we also need a legislative framework in place to actually frame that ambition and uh, enforce the uh, uh, direction. And the current commission, Powell, I think, uh, gave us the highest ambition yet when it comes to climate. Um, we've had the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 package, and the latter, of course, is almost finished. Uh, the almost last piece is the European uh, Performance of Buildings Directive. Uh, that's currently being discussed between member states, commission, and, uh, and, and, uh, and parliament. And we hope to have a final and ambitious outcome soon that will set us on the, on the right path. Yeah. But, but then what? That's one big piece mm -hmm. of the puzzle. But then what are we doing towards 2050? And we're delighted to have you with us, Paul Kathia Audi from DG Enna, who works on energy performance of buildings directive and deals with support for digitalization and modernization of buildings in Europe. 
your stepping information with us, Stefan. Thank you so much for making it. Yes. And uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts about how the EU's vision for building storage mm -hmm. 2050 looks like. Power the floor okay. is yours. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, uh, thank you for inviting us to be here today. And also, apologies from Matthew for not being able to be, to be here today. So, um, so uh, a vision for a decarbonized sustainable building or, or decarbonized sustainable EU um, in 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. I think you only got I'll, nine left. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll give it a go. So, um, first of all, if we want a decarbonized EU, I think it's it's very, very important to underline the uh, the aspect of the importance of buildings, uh, because at the end of the day, we represent 40% of the energy consumption, so unless we do something about buildings, we will never get to a decarbonized EU. So, that's the first point. Then, in order to get there, uh, how will buildings look like, how the building stock will look like, I think the first point is it will be very energy efficient. And that's not just because of the mm. energy efficiency first principle, but it's because it's indeed the, uh, the first stone to, to do that. Uh, so we'll have more insulation, better systems, better controls, better um, how we manage the overall building um, and the building stock as a whole. Of course, we'll have lots of integrated res, renewable energy sources on site, but also through the grid, which brings me to the next point, uh, which is that buildings will need to be much better integrated um, with the grid. So we need better, smarter buildings in this regard. We need buildings to be much more uh, adaptable uh, to the user needs, but also much more adaptable to the demands of the grid, um, because we will have a very flexible grid in, in that regard. And also, because um, buildings will be one of the key elements in order to <coughs> ensure the electrification of the uh, of the transport sector. So we will start charging uh, our cars in, in buildings, be, the, be there at home or when we are working. That will need to be uh, integrated in the, um, in the buildings. Now moving into other aspects of buildings, of course, um, they will have to be much more comfortable and much more healthier. Uh, sorry, much healthier. Um, up until now, we were basically designing buildings pretty much to just make sure that they're comfortable and we're not killing anybody uh, in the process. Um, we are moving from that direction. Uh, I think we are now designing much more towards what we call in, uh, a correct indoor environmental uh, aspect in, in buildings. So we're not just talking about temperature, we're not just talking about CO2 levels, but also how we look at, for example, the daylight levels in buildings, how we make sure that the lighting is correct, how we make sure that the uh, it's not just the CO2 levels in the room, but also um, the uh, volatile organic compounds, etc. So we may, we need to make sure that those uh, those aspects are taken into consideration, and that the building is able to respond and adapt to those needs. Um, of course, they will need to be much more sustainable, and and that particular reflects uh, on the aspect of uh, the use of materials. What kind of materials do we use uh, in buildings? And that actually brings me to the last point, almost, uh, which is will it look different? Uh, and that's something that I, that, so will the buildings, will the building mm. stock look different? And, and I'm not very sure how different they will look. Um, that's maybe a question for the architects, but um, we have 75% of existing buildings, uh, sorry, 75 of the buildings we have here today will still be in 2050. So in terms of looks, it will not look very different maybe. Mm. It will definitely perform and, and behave uh, much more differently. Now the question is also how we get there. And then we have the policy framework and, and the legal framework. You, you mentioned the, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the EU Green Deal. That's the first step. That we are already setting some of the elements in this 20, 2050 vision. For example, in the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, we introduced the, um, the definition of zero emission building. That is a zero emission, that is a building that is already ready for 2050. And the reason for it is that pretty much anything we build after 2030 by 2050, we'll already have to perform as if it was already mm -hmm. decarbonized. So it needs to be there. But there is also a whole host of other directives that really touch on the building sector, uh, like the Energy Efficiency Directive, the uh, Renewable Energy Sources Directive, and of course the Sustainable Construction, um, which is under development at the moment. Um, we also have to make sure that in order to ensure this transformation, we provide uh, the necessary finance, and that's public and private finance. Uh, banks need to be very well integrated in this process, and that's one of the reasons why we're developing the taxonomy, which will be updated as we go along. And last but not least, we need to provide all the necessary technical and administrative assistance to citizens. We need to be able to ensure that people know 
even how they need to renovate the buildings, what's the best process to do mm. it, what are the solutions available, and how can they go along it. Mm. Excellent. So I, I think I tried. I, I think you did very well. Thank you so much for these uh, uh, open sort of thoughts. And I think mm. you're saying a couple of things, or, or many things, of mm. course, are hugely important. I mean, one thing is, you were a little bit crass about it. You said that so far we've just made sure that no one's killed in the buildings, right? Mm. But seeing that the average European spends 90% of their time in, yeah. in, inside, it, it's interesting that we're only now coming to the point where we're actually talking about, sort of in more substance, mm -hmm. what it means to live in a happy, healthy, mm -hmm. well-performing building and what that does for you, mm -hmm. for your health, but also for your productivity and your performance. So I think mm -hmm. that's really interesting. The other thing you said, that's a point I think that we sometimes forget is, to your point, I mean, the Brussels of 2050 looks pretty much like the Brussels today in a sense that mm -hmm. most of the buildings are standing. Mm -hmm. So it's about how can we really sort of amp up those renovation rates uh, and, and make sure that people have access to the right sort of uh, channels of information funding to, to, to get in that journey. Mm -hmm. Good. So thank you. And with that, uh, I'd like to turn to Katarzyna Wadal, uh, who is a board member of Eurace and also the EU Public Affairs Manager of Knauf Insulation. And Katarzyna, sort of a broad question to sort of kick you off. Um, what specific challenges and opportunities do you see in achieving these highly energy efficient buildings by 2050 that we all dream about? Uh, thanks, Julie. Uh, thanks for your question. I think, uh, first of all, we need to realize what kind of energy system of the future there will mm. be. Actually, yesterday there was a new report published by IRENA, Renewable, International Renewable Energy Agency, mm -hmm. and again we heard that the future of a decarbonized energy system will be largely renewable and electric. Mm. So this is the direction. And what does this mean? It means, of course, that uh, uh, we'll, there will be more electrification in transport, in mm. buildings, but also in industry. So mm. all sectors will need more electricity. And then let's look at the grid that Paul mentioned. We will need more electricity. The grid will need to meet new peak demand. And also, zooming on buildings, there will mm. be new winter, seasonal, and mm. daily peaks when everyone is starting heating their homes mm -hmm. in winter. And then uh, our estimates by Knauf Energy Solutions are showing that this would mean more than tripling the energy grid to meet this mm -hmm. new uh, peak demand. Mm -hmm. uh, and why we are talking about peaks? Because, of course, the energy demand on average will be, uh, there will be a certain average demand, but the mm. peaks are really important, so reducing mm. the peaks, that will be decisive for scaling up the, the new grid, mm -hmm. will be really important. And this mm -hmm. is where the energy renovation is factoring in. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's very, really important because the, um, the impact of energy renovation on reducing the peaks mm -hmm. is even five times higher than on reducing the energy demand. Mm alone overall so we we are living in, we will be living in a new world where we need to manage peak demand and mm -hmm. that's that's that changes everything i think it changes the role of energy renovation because it pos positions energy renovation energy savings in buildings in the energy system and i think this is really important that um, i think there are three points that i would like to mention here uh, it means that we need to start modeling and planning energy system, looking at the role of energy renovation, how much energy renovation can reduce peak demand. Mm -hmm. We will need to then look whether and how capacity markets that can reward energy efficiency mm -hmm. in buildings. And I think we, we saw certain buzzwords and keywords here. I would add competitiveness as well, because already now, actually in transport heating, in electricity, the, the system costs are linked to managing demand by one fourth, 25%. Mm -hmm. This is what research shows. So we will also have cheaper, more optimized energy system, the grid, if we look at the role of energy renovation and we really take care of this part mm -hmm. of the transition. So it also means that energy prices, electricity prices, mm -hmm. have a chance to be optimized to be lower for mm. everyone, for industry, for consumers, for building owners. So it's about our competitiveness as well. So that's also my message. Building renovation is also important for Europe's competitiveness. So we can save money, we can improve comfort, we can do all yeah. these things that were mentioned, but uh, we also need to start positioning energy savings in the energy system planning modeling. And I think this is very important when we start talking about 2040 targets, when you look at 2050, this needs to be factored in. And I think in the next months, 
uh, this, that there will be more places even to discuss that. Yeah. that. That was the main message I wanted to convey. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. And, uh, and thank you for this plug. As, you know, sort of energy efficiency in buildings and renovation is also a strategic choice for Europe, yes. right? And I think that comes back to the overall sort of theme of this session. There is just no way around buildings and, and optimizing that stock for a number of reasons, including, to your point, to manage this grid, that's going to be much more based on renewable sources going forward. Um, we talked a lot about sort of digitalization and smart already, and with us now online, hopefully, we've got Dr. Irene Di Martino, who is the CEO of Ampex. Irene, can you hear us? I hope you can hear me too. We can. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us online. Thank you for having me online. And apologies, I can't be there in person, but it's good to be anyway, contributing even remotely. You know what? This is one of the good things that came out of, of COVID, I think, right? That we can now do many more of these events uh, um, in sort of a hybrid format and allowing people both here in Brussels and online to participate. But Irina, we've heard a lot about uh, digitalization smart, uh, and now we'd like to hear directly from you. Um, how do you think that your technology, so digitalization and the application of smart technologies in buildings can accelerate the clean energy transition to 2050? Yes, I, I can first of all echo with the with the, what the peers have been saying just before me. So we are facing, I think, a moment which is quite complex for end users, for consumers, for uh, whether they are residential or commercial behind the meter end users. But uh, because they face the complexity of the, the, that are associated with the electrification of heat and transport with the smart uh, technologies that by now is in most people's homes and, and most buildings. But to us, that should be an opportunity. If we find the appropriate technology, which we advocate in Ampex, needs to be user-centric, needs to be able to... Uh, interpret and cater for the needs of the users in a seamless manner without burdening the users with triggers that are behavioral and for that reason they can be repeatable and sustainable over time. If we think about behavioral demand response, we have a non-wide alternative that I think that the lady before me uh, referred to, we need to manage demand at peak mm -hmm. times. We have been seeing examples of that which are great if we consider them in a short time window, but when we think about fully decarbonized grid, those are not uh, the ways to have um, catering for the intermittency of supply around non-dispatchable renew renewable. So we need to think of smart technologies and opportunities around consumer-centric approaches like the ones that we have developed with our energy management system behind the meter, where we nudge and cater for the needs of the users whilst we also alleviate grid constraints, whilst we also shape dynamically the load, but we do it seamlessly and we do it uh, using AI and machine learning technologies in order to uh, essentially utilize consumer behavior insights to nudge their, their, their habits around uh, energy consumption in a way that allows us to cater for the need of flexibility on grid. So I think it's a moment for great opportunity, but we need to help the end user navigate complexity around the vast uh, uh, plethora of smart technologies and apps and the fragmentation of mm. those apps that the user actually faces. Thank you, Irene. This is a really interesting point, I think, around this sort of a, just the, the, the plethora of solutions and how to best get them to consumers in a way that makes sense to them. And I think that goes for the sort of applications you have, but also, of course, in a whole renovation sort of value chain. How do we make this smart and easy for people out there? Um, Oliver, I'd like to turn to you now. You're the uh, managing director of the Building Performance Institute Europe, and you're doing a lot of research, of course, on, uh, well, buildings, performance, as the name suggests. Uh, we, we've talked about sort of uh, buildings. We've talked a lot about energy efficiency. We talked about stability of the grid. Uh, what we haven't talked so much about yet is carbon. Um, so what are the um, sort of key aspects that you consider essential for a 2050 vision on buildings? And how does this impact embodied and operational carbon consumption over time? Because there's a shift here, of course, as we move towards more sophisticated buildings and building te techniques. There definitely is a shift. Thank you very much, Judy, for the question. Um, in the past decade, we built, on average, every year, about 350 square kilometers of new buildings in the EU27. 350 square kilometers is a very abstract figure. It is about two and a half times the size of 
residential homes and buildings in Berlin every year. That's the, mm. the size, what we're impacting. If we take a whole life carbon perspective, the building sector is actually responsible for about 41% mm. of European greenhouse mm. gas emissions. And um, if we continue the growth of new buildings, which you have seen in the past decade, we are growing the floor space by around 40% uh, until the middle of the century. And this growth and the emissions coming from construction and the construction mm. materials will more or less neutralize the reductions which we are making through operational efficiency and through decarbonizing mm. heating and cooling. And that is really the biggest problem. And that is why it's good that the new Energy Performance of Buildings Directive mm -hmm. starts introducing the topic of whole life carbon and asks member states to at least monitor and report mm -hmm. on the carbon footprint of new buildings. Um, but we also know that we cannot only report and monitor, we need to think about introducing mm -hmm. limits, introducing benchmarks for new buildings, and we need to overall make sure that we have policies in place to reduce the whole life carbon footprint of buildings. Now this is the connection or the point where the operational efficiency of buildings and the question about sufficiency actually intersect. We need to ask the question whether we need to build that many additional square meters in the coming years, whether we really need those square meters, or whether we could not repurpose and redesign the existing building stock in deep renovation activities. And we also need to answer the question whether we should not rather concentrate our scarce resources which we have, whether it's material resources or labor resources or financial resources, in making sure that our existing building stock is fit for purpose. Now, what does actually fit for purpose mean? Well, it means fit for a climate neutral future. It also means fit for a future where equality in society is increasing again. Now, if we look at societal drivers, we see changing use patterns because society is changing. Um, family compositions are changing once or twice in people's lifetimes. That's just a, a fact. Um, people live longer. We have an aging society. People have different needs when they grow older for their buildings. And they have different financial means. And I think we need to reflect that when we are redesigning our building stock, when we talk about a vision for the future building stock. And we must answer the question how we can really dynamically steer these needs, but also meet the needs of this changing society. The other big driver of change, of course, is the environment. We need to accept that weather extremes will increase and that they will become the norm. And therefore, we need to be much, much more active to make our buildings resilient mm -hmm. and adapted to climate change so that they actually provide the relief and the shelter which mm -hmm. we are seeking in them in such um, extreme events. Um, overheating and heat stress is killing thousands of people every year already. These are deaths which could be easily prevented if we would ensure that our buildings are more resilient and are more adapted to, to climate change. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to another topic, the energy security topic. We have seen in the past year how quickly anxiety levels in mm. the society can increase mm. through price peaks. Um, it is uh, therefore obvious that we need to stop energy waste in, in our buildings. Um, and as Paul also illustrated in, in the beginning, we need to make sure that buildings become power stations. Mm. Um, and that these buildings contribute again to the resilience increase of mm. the energy grid. Because, of course, um, the energy grid, our whole energy system is impacted by climate change um, as well. So, for me, the, the vision for our future buildings need to integrate and reflect these three big challenges. The changes in our society, which have dynamics on their own. The changes in the environment, um, which make it necessary that we combine adaptation and mitigation much more mm -hmm. than we do at this point in time. And of course, the urgency to reduce the climate impact of the sector as a whole, in a whole life carbon perspective, um, so that we actually have the opportunity to act and react on, on the first two points. Mm. So we need a multi-dimensional strategy yeah. um, to ensure that our buildings are healthy, safe, that they're climate neutral, and that they are 
fulfilling the needs we have at the core of our existence. And I think we need the regulatory framework to ensure mm. that, but we also need to have a sector commitment, almost a code of conduct from the construction industry, that the construction industry is going to deliver those renovation services and is building new buildings, if necessary, to these higher standards, even without policy always setting the higher standards, because we know policy making is often a compromise, but the sector can lead. And I think that's what we need to make sure that we have this fit for the future vision for our buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. I think you managed to say an awful lot uh, and an awful lot of interesting things. And, you know, I think, I think the discussion here about the... Uh, the carbon and the embodied operational uh, um, carbon also just shows how this issue is shifting, of course, over time. Because if we're on the one hand offsetting, uh, you know, through energy efficiency and then adding to that through the construction, then of course that becomes a zero sum game and it can't be. So I think this notion of looking at the, uh, the, the new building stock in particular and setting those level, which will then also in turn uh, impact the rest of the value chain, is, is super important and for sure. Uh, something we'll discuss in the 2040 framework as well going forward. So um, you talked about uh, resilience, you talked about consumers, and that provides a really good sort of a, a, a point to the next speaker, who is Guillaume, who is the Senior Sustainable Buildings Officer at BEC, the European Consumers Organization. And you could see there when we did the word cloud, s stuff around comfort, health, well-being, uh, not surprisingly, perhaps very far up people's list. How do you envision buildings promoting these two things when we look at uh, a 2050 society? Well, thanks, Julie, for this question. Uh, indeed, having the consumer perspective is very important for the wall industry. Uh, combining health and comfort is definitely uh, what we need to reach, uh, not by 2050, but as soon as possible, mm -hmm. and to empower, actually, uh, consumers uh, on, that, uh, on that pathway. We need three main things. Uh, three, at least I wanted to bring three main topics today. Uh, the questions related to uh, finding the right balance between the uh, envelope improvement and the change in the heating and cooling system. Mm -hmm. You need people to understand the, the pathway, so you need to uh, enlighten them via uh, what is the most important vehicle at the moment that we have, the energy performance certificates, because you have across Europe uh, different uh, housing stock, you also have different climates and uh, households. And as mentioned by Oliver, uh, of the compositions of the households will evolve, uh, the climate will evolve, so we need to uh, remain flexible and keep the inner temperature in a range yeah. that people can feel uh, comfort. And in parallel to that range of temperature that needs to uh, stay uh, into certain brackets, you also need to uh, have investment uh, mm. into a certain bracket because mm. not everyone can invest um, uh, what, we, what will be needed, but uh, you need to make it clear for uh, households of um, the trade-offs between the investment you, uh, mm. you, you do, uh, you get funding as well uh, to, and be supported, but you make uh, the parallel and clear the trade-offs between the investment and the resulting comfort because you need to uh, understand where to put uh, your investment level mm -hmm. and we don't need deep retrofits everywhere in Europe. In some climates it's beneficial, it's a mm -hmm. no-brainer. In some others you need to fine-tune the investment. So that should be clearer in the uh, main vehicle consumers all know across Europe uh, the EPCs. And so uh, it's also a matter of uh, addressing to uh, prevent overheating the questions related to uh, shading uh, way more, because that's the best return on investment you can make regarding uh, cooling, a passive solution. <laughs> Another topic I wanted to, to bring is the questions related to uh, ventilation, because it's key for the health of people because that's the quality of the inner air that's, uh, that's at stake. Because uh, as mentioned, part of, uh, part of us will have to invest once you get the guidance uh, into uh, insulation and air tightness to mm -hmm. keep the warmth inside during uh, winter. But at the s in the same time, you will keep the moist inside and this is bad for your health because it can lead to uh, hazards like mm -hmm. uh, moldy situations when it uh, can get out of control. So ventilation definitely needs to go hand in hand with deep retrofit so that you don't create uh, those situations. 
But it's here important to have in mind that it's not only uh, technical solutions that need to be implemented, you also need to address the, the behavior change because you can have all the natural and mechanical uh, ventilation you want or auto auto automated, sorry. Uh, but then you also need to keep in mind that the behavior will need to evolve, uh, be it for the summer, winter, mid-seasons, and people need to understand better. Mm. I'm always uh, surprised, and I think it's a bit odd, that for any electronic gizmo you buy, you get a 30 pages thick notice on how to use it in 20 different uh, languages. And then when you get the keys of a new home, mm. with all the technical systems, all the parameters you need to factor in to be uh, in a healthy environment, comfy and at, a, at an affordable price, then you don't get anything to support your choices. So it's, this needs to be addressed as well. And so, uh, so the two first points raised were about the uh, physical environment. I wanted to also bring into the, the debate the questions related to uh, how to do the, fir the further step into reducing energy use. It's the uh, demand flexibility from the consumer side. We heard uh, Irene talking about consumer-centric. I think it's also important regarding the demand flexibility offers to have a polycentric uh, consumer model in mind because uh, household profiles are different. So will be the consumption pattern and what the offers would have to be um, put in place so that you match the, the need for flexibility. Mm -hmm. And it's also important here, I think, comfort is not only um, an objective physical uh, consumption, it's also psychological. And I, I think it's important to have uh, consumers having a hand on their consumptions. It's not an all AI solution. I know we're talking about 2050, uh, all geeky people uh, <laughs> being born now, perhaps more geeky than I am. Uh, but. I think it's important if you want to feel comfy that you also have the hand on uh, some of your consumptions and not leave it to the cloud uh, so that you can override the system. If in, even if you took uh, an offer uh, that is uh, driving you into certain uh, nudges regarding your behavior, at some point, in some cases, you still need to get the flexibility on the flexibility to, co to consume more energy, for example, if you're sick. Do you have to be penalized because you need more warmth? You, you need so uh, adapted offers and flexibility within the flexibility to, to get people on board. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And again, some, some points I think that uh, the other speakers also picked up on around this sort of notion again of the consumer at centre and how do we facilitate their life so that they in turn can unleash all these benefits for themselves, but also for, uh, for, our, for our globe and overall. So, you know, we, we've talked about here from the policy perspective, we've talked from the consumer perspective, we've talked from the manufacturing perspective, we've talked from the research perspective, but, you know, here at the end, we've got someone who actually really holds one of the big key solutions position representing the architects. Um, Scott McCauley, you're the coordinator of the Anthropocene um, Architecture School. Um, so as an architect, I mean, how do you see the role of design in shaping sustainable buildings and their impact on the environment and people? Because again, I mean, we, we have a lot of good ideas here, but you're, how do you feel about this? <laughs> uh, yeah, so from the perspective of design, between 80 and 90% of the impact of a building environmentally comes from the very first design decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about us being able to design, it's having those policy frameworks and the legislation in place that says, we are going to, even this, things as small as orientation of buildings is so mm. important. So even zoning, how we lay out housing is incredibly important. So those frameworks and policy and le legislation cannot simply look at energy efficiency. They must look at how you've got the adaptability and freedom of design. And the kind of the role of design, because about 75 to 80 percent of buildings will use globally already exist, it's going to be moving from this idea of creation endlessly into stewardship. So I see the kind of the role of the architect as being less of this kind of mythological master builder and more mm -hmm. of a steward, an educator, mm -hmm. and being that the nexus point between the products, the technologies, because the most efficient building is the one that's the simplest to run. So you mentioned that there's no guidebooks for buildings when you move into mm -hmm. them. The role of design is to make sure that guidebook is not 30 pages long, it's about two pages long because we've had the capability of designing buildings that do every single thing we need to do in terms of energy comfort for since Passive House was developed in the 90s. So we've had 30 years of buildings that have an incredibly low energy demand that are passively designed. 
and it's looking at that legislation from a human perspective because we've heard about consumers but we yet to, we've also heard about people struggling but fuel poverty in the context of having the technology we have is a political choice that fuel poverty is not a design problem we have all the solutions so i'm going to tell a story from where i'm from in glasgow where there was a tower block where people were living in fuel poverty excessively. It was the Woodside Flats. And this incredible story came out in COP26. So because of a deep energy retrofit, people hadn't had to turn their heating on for two years. Mm. So we already have the solutions. There is n nothing to say that we need until 2025 even to develop those solutions because we have them today. We do not need to wait for AI to make our buildings incredibly energy efficient. But to make it even more human as well, that legislation has to go beyond performance. It has to include building performance evaluation as a minimum, because the between 40 and 70 percent of whole life carbon is embodied carbon. Mm. So we need to look at the human elements. So that's things like tying energy efficiency to rent controls, which means that you cannot rent out a building if at a high price if it's not energy efficient. So you can then balance that playing field of power, because this is a question of power, because the people with the least means are already suffering the most. Mm. So when we pull it back to design, we have amazing examples. So part of the panel tomorrow, I'm going to show some of the examples that our buildings that are incredibly energy efficient that we've been designing and delivering for 10, 20 years. So we have the solutions but it's about reframing that from stewardship and all energy efficiency works as, a, as in care. So 40% of all the money we spend on healthcare comes from our buildings. So good policy and legislation on buildings in any way, shape or form is public health policy. Mm. So it's reframing that from just efficiency markets, take the capitalism out of it and call it care. So you pull that back and for every well-designed building, every improvement, you're improving someone's quality of life. So we should be reframing this policy debate and having it as a public health strategy, kind of EU-wide, but also to look at a wider energy transition that cannot just be looking within the EU. So a just transition has no borders and recognises no borders. It must be, how are we looking at loss and damages from COP26? How are we taking the technologies we have here in Europe and supporting countries in the global south that historically have been colonised and extracted from? It's taking what we do here and being generous and mm -hmm. sharing that with the world wider. So it's about care and it's about generosity and it's about stewardship. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for those uh, uh, words, Scott. And with that, we're done with the, with the opening remarks. Um, you can now ask questions, or maybe some of you have already asked questions, via Slido. Do we have a slide coming up with that? But while we're waiting for those uh, questions to sum up, so thank you very much. I think you all gave uh, sort of very sort of passionate sort of interventions with uh, highlighting different aspects, but some of them, of course, come together. And this is sort of notion of, of comfort that also translates into health, that also translates into health savings, which I think is very important. Then there's also the bit about resilience, which I think is very important, and which we haven't talked so much about sort of in European um, um, policy making so far, this notion of preparing for a world where we're not just mitigating climate change, but also sort of adapting um, our our buildings to that. And uh, uh, maybe, Paul, do you do you have a, do you have some thoughts on that in terms of, of where we, what we should do? Sorry, I was writing something down. Could you repeat the question? No, I was talking about sort of this notion of sort of mitigation yes. uh, and adaptation. So we're, we're talking a lot about what to do still to to decrease uh, climate mm. change. But what about the, the changes already in place? Uh, you know, what about sort of this notion of, uh, of overheating versus cooling mm -hmm. so on and so forth? Do you maybe want to say a bit about that? Um, no, yes. I mean, it is something that um, we, try, we want to try and avoid as much as possible. Mm. Um, I mean, climate change, of course, that's mm. where a lot of our legislation is going. But at the same time, uh, we already accept the fact that we are mm. going to a 1.5 degree increase, mm. at least. And we already see that uh, this is causing massive problems in terms of, uh, of overheating mm. in buildings. Uh, we expect um, cooling demand to increase significantly in the, uh, in the coming years, uh, especially in southern European countries. And, and there, um, there are different elements that we need to take into consideration. And, and I like what, uh, what Scott mentioned about the, uh, the impact of, um, of, um, of design, but also what, uh, sorry, forgot the name, but uh, the representative from Buke, uh, Guillaume. Guillaume, sorry, <laughs> uh, mentioned about the, uh, the importance of training. I mean, at the end of the day, mm. we need, we need to, to train people how to use the buildings, and, and that has a massive impact in, in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, of cooling. 
but it's it's definitely an area where we are we are looking more and more and mm. and it's already part of the legislation i mean when we design for overheating we don't need to design for overheating now we need to design for overheating that it's mm. going to take place in a number of years excellent mm. And I, I think the, the point you also made in your opening remarks, of course, is that 2050 might still seem relatively far away, but of it's course... It's only 30 years away. Exactly. I mean, when we look at sort of the mm. the, 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 the life cycle of a building, mm. um, those are the improvements you need to make today. Uh, so, Katashna, to you, I mean, we, we're talking a lot about sort of how we need to sort of uh, empower the consumer. We need to increase renovation rates. There are lots of choices out there. We need to help them sort of uh, 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 make the right choices. Um, how do you think we can facilitate this sort of uh, collaboration between public and, and private um, sectors to, I mean, to try to get to this renovation rate? Because we've got the solutions, we've got the need, we've got all the organs, but how do we go about it? Yes, thanks, Julie. Uh, I think it's a really good question. Um, uh, there is this discussion about one-stop shops right now in the new EPPD, and I think mm -hmm. it's really crucial. And uh, some my previous speakers also mentioned technical assistance, mm. advice, highest possible standards. And I think we need to realize that without private sector business, mm. without technologies and mm. professionals, this transition will not happen. Mm. So the role of uh, private sector is really key. And the collaboration between the public and private is really centric. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we also we see the role of the turnkey solutions such mm -hmm. as one-stop shops that could be, uh, you know, um, they are able to design, to offer, to 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 measure savings, uh, to look at the building how it is, to plan everything from A to Z, mm -hmm. and then at the very end, after the renovation is completed, savings are well measured, the quality mm -hmm. is there and confirmed, that they are also able to explain building uh, occupants how to behave, how to how to uh, live in the, such a renovated building. Mm. So we see actually this new revision of the EPBD and this uh, article on one-stop shops as the driver for business case for renovation that is there. We know that, but we think that actually there are really interesting, um, also you know, um, ed future jobs opportunities also for young people. Mm. It is not only just putting some, installing that solution and another solution. It's a holistic system that can be measured that technologies that are mm. modern uh, there, you know, we can also attract people and we can create new business models that are already existing, but I think we can give the right direction. So there is a, the collaboration should, should happen mm -hmm. and we should remember that actually when business is there, then you know we can get the right scale. So uh, we advocate also for not for not limiting uh, one-stop shops to only public ones because we know that such yeah. discussions occur. We think that it's to the contrary that actually private sector business needs to see opportunity there, and opportunities are are definitely there. Yeah, so I think your, your point here is that we really need all solutions in deck, and uh, there's already pretty good uh, partnership, but we need to be flexible in approach as well to what uh, what sort of solutions can work out there. Um, so we've got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, the first one is about thinking beyond energy efficiency into concepts like system efficiency and operational efficiency. Um, I think the answer to that is yes. I think we really, <laughs> I think we really discussed that to make sense. But uh, Irene, maybe you have some uh, more thoughts on that. Uh, one of the peers referred to the uh, need to think operational efficiency. When we think of, of buildings, I think it would be a uh, partial view to just focus on, on building efficiency, on energy efficiency, because those measures, are uh, point solutions are best, and they don't really allow us to make the most of the AI and the uh, data, you know, the digitalization uh, opportunities that we are actually trying to harness with technologies that, uh, as I said, are there to help navigate complexity and make it easier for the end user and maximize the benefits of the visibility that we get through the data. So in my view, we need to shift the, 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 the arguments and as well as speaking about energy efficiency, we need to speak of system efficiency. When we think of, when we think of a whole system approach that we're big advocates of, uh, we think of a transversal view, we think of looking at the ways the infrastructure on grid can actually benefit 
the flexibility that we can unlock from uh, buildings. Therefore, we need to think of buildings not in isolation, but as uh, a, a, an integral part of the grid that they can help when we think of the flexibility that we can unlock from them by the use of uh, appropriate uh, uh, digital technologies. So for me, it's essential that we think of how can we optimize the load in a building in order to help the system. So that's where system efficiency comes in as well as energy efficiency. To me, it's fundamental that we think more holistically of the system rather than, uh, of course, an essential part, which is making the, build, the, the, the energy uh, consumption more efficient through measures that have been improving over the years, but they, are, they would only give us a partial benefit. And they would, you know, for me, it's now time to think more holistically. Excellent. Does anybody else want to come in on this? Oliver, maybe? Um, I think the, the point which we're currently overlooking when doing analysis about mm -hmm. the costs and the benefits is that when we talk about setting efficiency standards for renovation mm. for buildings, we only look at the immediate uh, return on these mm. investments. We're not looking at the system benefits. We're not pricing it in, for example, that a flexible energy, uh, a flexible building stock where we have a high degree of demand flexibility will lead to a cheaper renewable energy system because mm. we do not have the peaks anymore. Mm. And I think that's one of the shortcomings which we currently see, that we do not have a truly comprehensive mm. cost-benefit analysis. And that we're putting or that we're basing our decisions on, on partial information only. Mm. So that leads to the obvious question, how, how are we going to get there? Well, um, mm -hmm. one of the tools that uh, the European Union actually has at its hand is the so-called cost-optimal methodology. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very uh, technical uh, thing. But it basically is a methodology which defines how member states should set the efficiency and the performance standards of their buildings. Mm. Um, it was developed um, more than a decade ago, mm -hmm. and it's now high time that we revise it. And I think the EPBD, the, the mm. current discussion, the proposal, um, contains the idea that we need to update it, that we need to revise it to have mm. a, a more comprehensive cost-benefit analysis. And so I hope this will be in the final agreement um, and that we then have very quick action from the Commission, mm. who, who's, uh, who will have to take the action, mm. to really revise that methodology to have a more comprehensive cost-benefit analysis. So power is writing down furiously anyway. I think that also addresses the, the, the third question here around the, the, the lack of data, which sort of goes to the same uh, um, uh, direction. So um, Scott and Guillaume, I mean, mm. you both talked, of course, about these sort of occupants, about, uh, about, about, about health and about sort of the, uh, the need to empower the people um, I, I, in the building. Uh, you talked about this being sort of health policy more than energy policy. The, question, the problem, of course, is that from a European Union perspective anyway, um, health and energy are two different animals that are regulated at two different levels. So, I mean, how do we, I mean, do you have any suggestions how we actually make sure that these health and comfort aspects are prioritized and are sort of integrated into building relations and standards? Because that's a little bit the issue as it stands. Uh, well, do you want to say it? Uh, yeah, so I can spend into answering one of the questions. Uh, there's a question on the decreasing home ownership in younger generations. So yes. lots of this is... Uh, the voice of younger Europeans needs to be centred in this a lot more. This mm. is not just a technical debate, it's also cultural. So the kind of what we are expecting from buildings is very, very different. And we have this appreciation that there is growing kind of climate anxiety. Mm. There is not just anxiety, there is grief, there is dread, there is terror. And in bringing that into the health discussion as well, it's about, it's not just reporting on energy, it's reporting on indoor mm. air quality, it's reporting on the toxins that are going into building materials. We have got so many petrochemicals going into buildings, flammable materials that should not be there. If we're going mm. to be regulating this, it has to, be, it has to be holistic in a sense that if you have to wear protective clothing to put it into a building, should it be there? So should we be looking at building sites of people mm. in full hazmat suits and respiratory? Like, we should not be having this. Mm. This is we have the technology, we have the means to design buildings that are healthy, but also reporting has to be in terms of 
when we build any building today, we can very easily integrate monitoring. So we can see the amount of CO2 in that air, we can see the under air quality, we can see humidity, we can see temperature. Every building built from tomorrow can and should have those sensors as a bare, bare minimum. And that should be reported in a way that's open source, that can be accessed by absolutely anybody. Anyone moving into a building should be able to see, does this building overheat? What's my bill going to be in the winter? So this is, it's all well and good talking about it from an industry perspective. Mm but we need to talk about empowering who's going to be living and using these buildings. So those sensors, that's a very easy way of, you need this to be open source. This, can be, this could be from tomorrow. So if, if we had one action from this panel tomorrow, every building that would be built in Europe that's completed should have sensors allow us to carry out a building performance evaluation that must be reported. It should be building owners should be, so in Australia there's the neighbours program, so you build an office, you report on the energy, that has to become standard across all building typologies. Mm. Actually in our cultural buildings, they already have most of these sensors, mm. so in archives and museums, they already have the built-in sensors. You could be doing this as a case study, so you could be taking a look at all of our museums and use them as a case study, here's how we deliver this across the sector. Mm. So we have the technology, but it's also, it has to be human. It has to be open source. We cannot be keeping this behind closed doors. This has to be in the public realm. It has to be accessible. So consumers, so building owners can see the effect their buildings have on people. So if you put people at the center, well, put life at the center because non-human life is very mm -hmm. important. But it's, we, can, we have to report on everything beyond energy. So we need toxins, we need whole life carbon, we need transparency in the supply chain so there's no... There's no slavery in that supply chain. There's no abuse. Mm. We, need, we need stronger union laws. Mm. We need stronger labour laws to ensure the people building those buildings are protected from the impacts of them as well. But it's, that's the kind of reporting has to go beyond energy and carbon. So energy and carbon, we've got quite good at those in construction, mm. sort of, kind of good. But toxins, for example, in the UK in 2012, there were 52,000 building materials being used and only 3% mm. of them have been tested against human health. Mm. So we yeah. need transparency that's yeah. how we get we get there through transparency and through it has to be a cultural transformation and begins in education so not just not just once you graduate and you move into industry from a very young age our schools have to be an example of the built environment of the future mm. so again plug the panel tomorrow i'm going to be talking about multiple schools yeah. that do that as well Thank you so much. And I think I think one of the really important things you said in all this is it needs to be accessible. Because mm. if you've got the data but no one can do anything with it, then then you know that doesn't really lead to any results. And so I think at that point, Guillaume, I mean, just perhaps really to to follow up on this and complete. Yes. Uh, I would like to also mention that you need standards that are uh, mm. open source mm -hmm. and and this, uh, uh, holistic, uh, but you also need to have them implemented. And yeah. what we observe is that the worst performing buildings most of the time are also uh, in the private rented sector. So yes. what we need for those standards to be implemented is more um, uh, residential market regulation. Yeah. And that needs to be implemented also at the local level. So you, you basically need someone to go and check. So that could rely on the one-stop shops we mentioned earlier. You, you have to have the workforce trained uh, to and uh, mandated uh, via local uh, regulation mm -hmm. to, to check the quality and the health uh, conditions in the, in the housing, private rented sector. Yeah. And uh, that's also uh, to address the questions related to younger generation. Uh, one of the points uh, we, we raise at Book are uh, the third ways. It's not only uh, being a tenant or being a homeowner, you also have the housing cooperatives that are uh, a third way because uh, what we observe at the moment is that uh, you have some kind of credit crunch. You have a lot of people not being able to uh, get a mortgage, for example. Most of them, I guess, being young. So you need a, fir uh, a third way to address this topic. Also to address all the um, uh, unintended consequences of uh, the, the retrofit of the private rented sector. Because what we observe in France, for example, is that some landlords don't want to be bothered in investing on top of what they have in energy efficiency. So you, you will find some uh, of, the, um, uh, of the housing stock idle and you don't want that because you have people in the street. So you definitely stronger uh, regulatory frameworks mm. to uh, drive this, uh, this retrofit. It's not only a, a question of uh, insulation, bricks and mortar, mm. it's also yeah. a question of regulations. 
and you know, this 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 owner tenant issue we've discussed for all the years <laughs> I've worked on energy efficiency in the building stock, and that's coming up in fifteen years. So, I mean. We all agree, all of us, no matter what perspective we're representing here, that's a real issue. But what on earth do we do about it to sort of time to make a difference? Does anybody want to dare coming in on that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about all these new standards, but it's about retrospectively applying mm. standards to existing buildings and raising benchmarks year by year. So if you're going to rent a building, it has to hit a benchmark and that has mm. to be ratcheted up every single year. So it's, it's one thing to, we also, we need a legislation that says a certain percentage of rent must go to maintenance, because this is not just a retrofit problem, it's mm. basic repair and maintenance. Mm. We need legislation that has a maintenance cycle built in. As much as we need to be checking the consequences of retrofit, we need any building being rented, being owned, we need to have a, an, enforced, an enforced maintenance cycle. So every two mm. to three years, but even if that's as small a measure as checking the gutters aren't overflowing, mm. Because like in Scotland, our rainfall has doubled since the 90s. Yeah. So all rainwater goods installed in buildings before the 90s are now out of date. And lots of these unintended consequences come from things as small as that. Mm. But it's like, we need maintenance. Maintenance has yeah. to be at the heart of this as well. So if we're going to start changing it, it's looking at what's standing up today, applying a standard to it and saying, if this is not, the standard is not hit, you cannot rent it. And if you refuse to improve it, it's going to have to be bought off of you and it's mm. going to have to go into some, some public control. Mm. It, it's not a case of we can just keep on doing building, accumulating profit. This has to be transparent and we need maintenance cycles and also people to go around to assess. We have the methodologies to access buildings like this. Mm. So if we start to kind of support, support the private sector and the kind of publicly providing those sensors to, and to enable not just that enforcement, to enable the support, to enable, to enable the pointing towards these one-stop shops to say this is where you get the advice, this is where you get the help. Mm. But legislation has to have maintenance. So fuel poverty is as much a problem that's arose from a lack of maintenance because money has been taken from uh, the wages of labour has gone from profit into private wealth and has not gone back into our building stock. That's a fact. That's not a, a left-wing opinion. <laughs> that is how things are. So we need maintenance to be enforced, and we need minimum standards. You bring in the maintenance cycle first, you bring in the, the standards second. So you give people the opportunity to improve their building stock before you start ratcheting up that. Mm. The kind of, not retrospectively, but having, if a building is going to be rented, it has to be a certain standard, not just energy efficiency, not just affordability, it has to be inclusive and also has to be healthy. So that's where you start. Your implementation starts maintenance first, assessment second, enforcement third. And then I think we're back to this notion of uh, of like EPCs, for instance, right, and making sure that you do something with the innovation you are given here, and that the innovation that you collect is useful, but also that is then shared with people in a useful uh, point. And Guillermo, I wanted to come back to you before because the consumer is clearly, you know, the the inhabitants at the centre of all this. But I mean, how how do we make sure that we educate and empower people to actually understand and take action on their own sort of indoor uh, environmental uh, quality? <laughs> Because there is this information, um, but yeah, how do we best take care of themselves, if you like, and the and the the homes are in? Well, it's a, a very broad question, and education was mm. mentioned before. But I I think we also need to address the misconceptions and the cultural uh, dead ends mm. regarding <coughs> how you manage your your home. Uh, also, perhaps the first thing would be to address uh, the, the fraud. I have in mind all those uh, TV programs where you have um, home um, uh, upgrades mm -hmm. and you, we, you are saying, like, <coughs> oh, just paint, uh, paint in white and you're going to gain uh, 15K on, the, yeah. on your home value. Perhaps we should address uh, the mainstream uh, misconceptions carried there on TV and have uh, new, new programs s explaining to people how they could behave, what the, the investment they could make, and follow, um, I think in the US it exists, uh, not in the <coughs> European programs I've heard of, <coughs> but to follow uh, the uh, retrofit programs of uh, different households mm -hmm. profile and explain how they can both invest and change the, the mm -hmm. behavior accordingly. It's also a matter of um, Engaging people with uh, with their own um, facts and uh, and and data, the last thing you want to 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 see is a collection of data and no feedback to people. 
uh, an interesting thing I've, I've seen in the US are the um, energy building benchmarks. So you have a mandatory uh, public disclosure of your uh, also water, but uh, let's say fluids consumptions, energy and water quarterly consumptions on uh, a website that everyone can see your uh, data, but not the address. Huh? It's anonymized. To, for uh, data security, and then that engages you in the, it's for multi-unit, but that engages you in the, the comparison, like it's peer-to-peer -peer comparison, it's uh, a, an engagement methodology. So if you can compare yourself with others and others can yes. compare with you, well, perhaps you, it's a good nudge for, for action. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. I was just thinking about this book I read for this behavioral uh, um, scientist um, who, for instance, found out that you, you, know, you can get people to do really boring stif stuff like update their pensions details, I especially by saying something like, you know, 73% of your peers have already done it. Why haven't you? Sort of to sort of motivate people to, uh, to, to keep up with that. Um, I'm looking at the questions here, and one that's on here, uh, which is also an important one, I think we keep on talking about, is how do we connect better with the financial sector? to speed up um, access to finance for renovation. And again, how do we make it easy? Uh, Tasha, do you want to come in on that? I think it links to data again, actually, uh, and uh, results of renovation, because financial sector really wants to know mm. what's the result of renovation, how many, how, what's the percentage of energy savings, and they want mm. to have it validated, well measured. And again, technologies are there. Mm. Measured energy savings are really important for the financial sector from what we can see and this is possible mm. and this is also linked to quality renovations. So proven measured results of renovations are one of the elements that can drive investments because then it's clear what the product is about, the result of renovation. So I think that's important and I wanted also to come back to the, to the tenant owner and requirements. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's at the heart of the debate now mm. on the minimum energy performance standards. But the good news is that in some countries, like in Belgium, for instance, there mm. are already certain mechanisms that could be called mm. trigger points or maps uh, already that uh, the, pr the price of the the the, ten, the, 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 mm, the price of the apartment that is rented cannot be increased mm -hmm. if a certain level of energy efficiency is not achieved. And of course, we should have a time horizon so that everyone in the market knows by which date uh, this should occur. It's really important mm -hmm. because renovations need to be planned. They yeah. don't happen from one day to another. But it's important to give a signal. Standards for existing buildings are important. It's an important part of the CPBD. We have already standards for new buildings. It's time to define standards for existing buildings. This requires giving perspective for the whole value chain. And of course, uh, after selling a building, there should yeah. be some time given for a new owner to renovate a building if the building is not meeting already the required energy level. And I think this is all possible and we see examples that it works. So yeah, yeah. but there are mm -hmm. solutions to that. Uh, it's the, the tenant, um, the tenant um, uh, and the landlord problem as you said, Julie, mm -hmm. is well known. But I think the good news is that mm -hmm. we can see solutions on the market. And the awareness that maintenance, the operation of the building is really linked so much, the costs mm -hmm. to the energy efficiency of the building. Yeah. This so awareness is increasing. And I think we should continue supporting, supporting that, support so we'll consumers. Oli, want to come in on this? I, I wanted to add um, to this aspect about the role of the financial sector and the responsibility of the financial sector. Mm. Um, the biggest amount of wealth on this planet is accumulated in our buildings. They're mm -hmm. the most precious, financially valuable asset we, we have. And that's good news for everybody who owns a home, because they have a certain safety net, an asset for mm -hmm. their old age, for their pension. And I think that's one of the reasons why many people buy a place mm -hmm. um, and to have that, that longer term perspective. But at the same time, um, buildings, are also a financial asset for speculation. Mm. And we often have behavior by financial institutions which is uh, you know, guided by maximizing return on investment, mm. maximizing profits, and I think that's a part of the problem. Because if we simply, s or if certain uh, powers in society see buildings only as a financial asset for profit maximization, all the other aspects what buildings actually should do for society are left out. And I think that's where we need mm. some reform. 
that's where we need um, to have a change of behavior, a change of business practice, that the financial community as such really reforms its own guidelines, its own thinking, and invests much, much more in healthy and efficient and mm. climate resilient buildings. I think we, we need to have this change in investment patterns that can be supported by regulation. It can be supported by the taxonomy, mm. but for that, the, te the taxonomy, the, sorry, the taxonomy needs to be much more ambitious. Mm. That's, that's clear. So it is a, a very complex debate and none which we can close here, but I uh, think we need to dive much more deeply into that issue. Could I expand? Yes, of course. I think, so that's, that's really good. We talked about the kind of the, how much wealth is accumulated in buildings, but there's another, in terms of beyond this directive, uh, one of the largest pots we have of money and wealth and resources that moves around the world today are subsidies for fossil fuels. Imagine if all of the money we poured into the fossil fuel infrastructure and industry was to be redirected into making our building stock healthy, resilient, and climate adapted. That could be enacted incredibly easily. That's, it, com it does have to come from top down, but it also needs to come from bottom up because we have lots of places where we're seeing these encouraged uh, support from workers in these industries. For example, in Scotland, there are lots of workers in the North Sea oil industry who want to transition. But it's, it's talking about the elephant in the room that there's a fantastic quote from a historian, Barnabas Calder, and it's that form follows fuel. So where are we, the energy we are using is going to shape our buildings in ways beyond that we can change. Mm -hmm. So it's about really speaking about where is wealth moving around the world. Investment is not just kind of in finan it's financial, but it's recognizing that we have the resources. The resources are going ways that are climate negative. And we do need to speak to that. So that the transition is going to be about phasing out fossil fuels. That has to happen. They are lethal. The air pollution from them is huge. Mm. It is literally a lethal sort of form of energy. But we, if we start to ask each member of states, like how much of your, how much are you going to start investing in the industry? So how, if for example in Denmark in about 2015, you got an eight percent return on investments in wind power, which was above what the banks could offer. Imagine what it would look like if every EU member state was to have pension funds shifting money from fossil fuels and arms into a renovation of buildings. Another massive pot of money, the development of weapons. Yeah. If there so yes. I, I think that's very true, and I think everyone agrees here we'd like more money directed towards energy yes. efficiency, but I also don't think it's the point of the panel to talk about the, uh, the oil and, and, and gas industry. Um, because I think already we're talking too little about energy efficiency and buildings, so let's, uh, let's focus on that. Um, I wanted to come back to the point that you made uh, in your opening remarks, Oliver, about the sort of notion of sufficiency. Uh, you know, maybe comfort does not equal a bigger place. Maybe it equals a, a, a better place. And also this notion that we sort of keep on reading about, about the notion of the, the integrated urban environment, right, where we maybe have a smaller individual space and more sort of shared space. And I was wondering, in all the work you're doing as BPA as well, where you look at a good examples across member states, do you maybe have some interesting observations to, to share on that? This sort of a shift between my individual kingdom to, to the shared space, to the benefit of all of us, that it also taps into what you were talking about, power around sort of integrating also uh, uh, power supply and uh, mobility and so on and so forth. Well, I, <clears throat> I think it's a societal shift which is not necessarily supported by policy, but by the individual wishes of people and how they uh, want to, to spend their lives. We currently do not have any policies which uh, support buildings which are more modular, more mm. easy to change. We do not necessarily have policies which make it interesting and, and attractive for people to downsize their mm. homes, for example, after the children have left. Right? That there are no support mechanisms, and I mm. think we, we need to think about what kind of support mechanisms we, we should put in place to make the well the potential movement the voluntary movement of people more dynamic without them taking mm. a financial risk because often people mm. stay in their place even if it's oversized because um, they take a financial risk by moving somewhere else or maybe they even have to absorb mm. a financial loss because real estate prices have developed in, um, in in one direction and i think that's where we need to connect social policies much more with mm. energy and climate change policies and where we essentially see a dilemma in, in the way how policy thinking is happening also in the European institutions. Mm. And for example, one of the reasons why we do not have a joint mitigation and adaptation strategy in the building sector, because DJ Energy is in charge of, well, making sure that our buildings are 
efficient and powered by renewables. And the adaptation topic lies more with DG Klima. So mm-hmm. While, of course, there is some, some collaboration between the DGs, mm-hmm. it, there is not a, a unified mandate to really bring it together. Mm-hmm. And we see that in many other policy fields. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the barriers which we need to overcome. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's one of the uh, main issues for the next commission, which mm-hmm. will start in uh, late 2024, to address. That we have more cohesive, more integrative policies in mm-hmm. fields where it's necessary. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Guillaume, you wanted to come in? Yes, on this notion of uh, sufficiency between mm-hmm. the lines, that's what uh, I addressed talking about the, the trade-offs, mm. because people uh, will need to have a better understanding of uh, like how much do I have to invest to get rid of uh, my, my backup system if I invest in an electric heat pump. But you can also make the mirroring assumption that you need to know how many weeks, for example, I would be cold if I don't have that back, that backup system, mm-hmm. or cold, colder, let's say. If you get, uh, instead of 16 degrees in your bedroom, you get a 12 degrees for two weeks, that's something you can navigate through. Mm-hmm. Because the, perhaps the extra cost of uh, a deeper retrofit is a, a deterrent for you, and mm-hmm. in any case, Even if you get public funding, we need to keep in mind that uh, consumers also are uh, taxpayers. So uh, in in any case, money will be uh, originating from somewhere, which might as well be your pocket most of the time. Uh, So you need to find the right balance. And perhaps here as well, the the conceptions regarding comfort during winter need to evolve, let alone uh, the winter itself uh, is evolving in a direction that we don't necessarily uh, Mm -hmm. are sure of. But uh, yes, that's the point on sufficiency I wanted to raise. Excellent. You wanting to say more? No? No? Good. Good. I'm just looking at the questions. I'm looking at the time. We've got one question left we haven't addressed, and we've got about 15 minutes left in the session. So it's on the construction products regulations revision. Somebody here says, industry is trying to water down sustainability aspects. How do we get the construction sector to engage better? Does anybody... This is another one of those files that doesn't actually sit on GGNA. So uh, from that perspective, I mean, Kasia, are you... Uh, I can, I can yeah. comment. Uh, yeah. Our event is not really about that, but no. uh, we see the need mm. that sustainability is tackled and addressed um, mm. in the construction product regulation because mm. the EPBD yeah. is at the building level. So CPR, mm. construction product regulation, mm. is about the product. So we as industry don't see a problem at all with sustainability aspects mm. uh, to be discussed in the CPR. So Mm-mm-mm. I can just say that uh, it's important to 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 set the rules there and we are ready to to discuss and we are doing that so i don't think we are part of that industry but industry is a broad spectrum so maybe yeah industry is in, indeed a very it's broad spectrum <laughs> and uh, <laughs> do, do you want to say something on it yeah no yes. i think i yeah. think she she mentioned something which is quite important um we need to talk with the industry yeah in the sense if we just uh, outright say like okay this is what needs to be done full mm. stop yeah. um industry is going to be very reluctant to react to it. Mm. It's going to say, wait, 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 wait a moment, what are you asking me for yeah. here? Uh, which I think is fully justified. At the yeah. end of the day, they are responsible for a, a significant amount of investment mm. and jobs. Mm. So um, it's it can be a bit um, dangerous or, or threatening for them. Mm. So. Um, I think it's important that industry is engaged throughout the process, mm. uh, that they are aware of why is there a need to do something, um, mm. and what is the timeline, and then discuss with them, okay, what can you do about it? Like, is it a matter of like, um, you need some more time to react, mm. or do you need more resources to react, or do you need to change in the, uh, in, the, um, in the legal framework? Usually industry, so long as they are given a stable mm. framework that they can then plan ahead, yeah they are okay with it. And, and I think we have a history of um, very successful uh, legislation um, and reactions to environmental crisis. I mean, the, uh, the whole, um, some of you may be old enough to remember the Montreal Protocol. It was a <laughs> massive change for the industry to go from mm-hmm. using CFCs to now we barely use them. Yeah. And it was done in record time. And mm-hmm. now we are finally reducing the size of the ozone uh, hole. So it, it can be done so long mm. as they are part of the, um, of the engagement process. If we just hand them a, a package, then I understand that they can be a bit reluctant to, uh, mm. to react. 
So I, I'm, I'm here as a moderator, of course, so I shan't in, in, uh, impose our veto exclusions. But I think certainly from a Euro's perspective, we're not working on construction products regulation at Euro, so we don't have an official position. Mm. But I think to your point, I mean, industry is many things. Um, and I think to your power, and, and I think that comes back time and time and time again, whether we talk about industry or we're talking about sort of uh, uh, member states, or we're talking about consumers, you know, we want to know what is happening. We want to have a framework going forward that is fixed. We want to have like a high level ambition. We want to have some deadlines. We want to have some measures to meet the overall ambition. Um, and I think also to your point, uh, time is running out, uh, not from a climate perspective, but also from the perspective that mm -hmm. for these things to take place in the building stock by 2050, you know, the, the, the time for regulation is, is, is right now. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're getting towards the end of this. I, I uh, promised or asked <coughs> uh, Paul um, to sort of uh, summarise maybe in a few minutes what you've... Uh, what are you taking with me? And what, yeah. what, what are you thinking? We were talking about the next commission. It's just around the corner. Um, yeah. What uh, you've done a lot. You really have done a lot. I think we're sat here sort of nitpicking a bit. But when I look at overall what the commission has achieved for the last five years or four yeah. years with one year to go, I mean that's we've really sort of elevated these topics to the sort of highest levels of uh, yeah. of, of urgency. Yeah. Uh, what next? What are you taking with you? What um, are you working on? Well, for for one thing, I take what you've just said because it's very. Um, Reassuring. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have done a lot, and not. I'm not just talking for the on behalf of the commission. I'm on behalf of the building sector as a whole. I think we forget how much things have changed in the last mm. ten years or so. I mean, when I was working in the uh, in the private sector, energy efficiency design was the the brand new word in the uh, in the sector. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knew what was uh, what it was about. Only a few. Uh, people that were much more advanced really knew how to deal with it, and nowadays it's basically almost business as usual, especially in, in new buildings. Um, so I think we need to be aware of how much we've actually changed things in the last in the last years. Um, a few takeaways uh, or, or things that have been coming back up uh, all the time. Uh, the role of information to users. Um, what is the current situation? How can they improve it? What solutions are available? Um, what is the building doing at this time? Mm -hmm in all aspects, not just on energy, but also on, on health and well-being. I think this is an element that has come up over and over again. Um, th at the end of the day, the building needs to serve its, its users, so we need to make sure that this can do, uh, this, this can be done, sorry. Um, another element that has been coming up all the time is the role of integration of buildings with a larger energy grid. Uh, buildings are no longer uh, standalone, um, but they are part of, a, of an important energy grid. And here I'm actually surprised that we haven't commented a lot, only, only very, very briefly, on the role of the, um, of the building as part of the urban environment. Uh, going beyond, mm. we tend to think of buildings as standalone elements. No, it's in, or now we are starting to really think more and more buildings as part of the uh, of the energy grid, but they're also part of a of a city, and that's that's quite important. For example, uh, the role of um, of buildings in reducing um, heat island effects in in urban mm -hmm. areas, which is quite important in southern Europe. Um, uh, we've also talked a lot about the change of, uh, of mind frame, uh, how we look, use, build, and value buildings at the moment, and how this needs to mm. needs to change in order to uh, to really be able to change the way we look, use, and and, and value buildings. And and last but not least, and I take note of this, uh, is the importance of the regulatory framework. Mm. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about uh, elements touching of minimum energy performance standards, for example. Um, and uh, even the uh, the cost uh, the cost optimal, which was surprised it came out, because uh, it's it's quite niche. I like it very much, <laughs> but um, it's not something you you talk about usually. Uh, but thanks for bringing it up, because <laughs> I do I do think it's very important. It is at the end of the day how we actually set up um, minimum energy performance requirements in buildings. So we need to get it right. Um, it's one of the cornerstones, and um, one. Last comment, perhaps, uh, just to close. Because here, all of us, we work on buildings. We are very much aware of the building sector and everything. But this is not really on everybody's mind most of the time. Um, it's Whether we like it or not, it's not everybody's priority. Uh, buildings is where we, use, we, where we live, where we work, but that's it. We have other. Um, or the things that drive our, our, our lives. And at the moment, and this links a bit to the information uh, to users, and, and I finish very, very quickly, mm -hmm. um, I think building owners and building users are constantly bombarded by conflicting information. Yes. And sometimes 
even going to the extreme of misinformation. I mean, the last few months, for example, on the issue of minimum energy performance standards have been quite intense on, on our side just to combat some of this, of this misinformation. Um, so I think it's important for all of us to, to be aware of, okay, we need to make sure that this uh, these aspect of information is well covered. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. So we've got eight minutes and 26 seconds left. So I wanted to give all of you uh, one last minute. Let's go to Irene, who is uh, still, I hope, online. Yes, I wanted to actually pick up on the earlier topic on the financial, the role of the financial institutions and financial incentives, especially as Ampex has been working uh, in Australia where we've got a strong footprint with retailers. And we are seeing uh, interesting discussions and we're actually taking part into interesting shaping of new business models where electrification as a service becomes uh, the way forward, thinking of the legislations around electrifying heat and transport, thinking about the adoption uh, for end users of everything electric and everything smart, the role of, of financial institutions and means to incentivize the adoption is key. And we need to have synergies between a number of different stakeholders to ultimately make sure that there is that level of adoption uh, at, across all uh, segments of the demographics, because if we if we think of targeting only early adopters, only those who are uh, able to afford the the, the purchasing of uh, of EVs or the installing of um, electric heat pumps, um, we're obviously only targeting the the very initial phase of what will be ultimately a, a fully decarbonized energy system that needs to see the management of uh, a fully uh, um, uh, all electrified uh, home and all smart and home. So I think financial institutions can play a role. Financial incentives needs to be absolutely brought into the picture when we think of managing and rolling out uh, technologies that enable uh, the dynamic load shaping or the management of peak. In Australia, they've got the opposite problem. They've got uh, such high penetration of rooftop solar generation that they need to manage minimum operational demand. So I think there needs to be an alignment. It's not just technology and uh, grid stakeholders. It's also financial institutions and the appropriate financial incentives. Thank you so much. And I think another interesting point here from you, Irene, is the Australian experience, because we typically sort of uh, look at what our neighbours are doing in the other member states, but we're not necessarily looking at outside Europe. So also very valuable to bring in that aspect. Uh, Tashna, you've got a, a minute. Um, you know, let's just assume that the EPPD will be done and dusted in a way that we're all uh, um, happy with. What would be like your one wish for the year for the climate law 2040 or the next mission? What's what's key issue? Um, maybe I will, uh, if I may comment mm -hmm. still on, on the minimum energy performance yep. uh, standards. Go ahead. I actually, I, I have a um, open question to the Commission. Yes, this misinformation has been seen in the media uh, in different countries, especially in the countries where there is no experience with maps. Mm. With uh, sometimes they are not called maps, but as I mentioned, in Belgium, other countries, Scotland, there are certain elements in the Netherlands, France, elements that could be called mm. maps. Whether you maybe it already exists somewhere, um, whether the Commission could uh, explain what could be examples of possible implementation because it's a directive at the national mm -hmm. level that would be in line with the current proposal. I'm saying this because we all heard probably about some worries. Uh, uh, people saying somewhere in the media, some articles, oh, well, am I going to be able to say my, sell my home, whether it's going to be possible mm -hmm. to rent mm -hmm. it? It will be possible, but mm -hmm. it's a directive. But I think uh, usually in the European mm -hmm. law making, implementation guidelines are issued after the law is yeah. adopted. But here, perhaps we could find mm -hmm. a way to explain what this EPBT proposal is really about and what mm -hmm. is it not about. Because I think the speculation, the negative mm -hmm. speculation around this proposal on, on maps specifically, mm -hmm. Could come for me. It comes personally from that that there is no experience in some places with maps, and people literally see the proposal, and think, "Oh my God, it's gonna be forbidden." Uh, you know, it's an interpretation, of course, but yes. it's not true. So maybe there could be some ways of communicating what is it about or what is it not about, because maybe that could maybe that could help. We we know it's not uh, aimed at forbidding anything on the market, but. Uh, it's about, uh, it's about setting the standard to drive renovation programs and so on. So maybe it's a suggestion that maybe we could think of some sort of um, guidelines 
about the text that mm. it stays as it is, even if the uh, if the negotiation process is, is not over. Maybe this could help explain it yeah. at the national level because I, I, I see personally the need for such for such mm -hmm. let's say extraordinary <laughs> explanation, you know, I, which usually we are not doing. Huh? I think it's such an interesting conundrum, right? Because years mm -hmm. ago, no one talked about energy efficiency in buildings, uh -huh. and now everyone's <laughs> talking about it, and now we're all so unhappy about that, right? Uh, I mean, when I when I think about my own sort of member state, Denmark, I mean the EPPD, I mean that was almost front page news in all the major newspapers this time around. I mean, that would never have happened five years ago, right? Mm. And so with that, of course, also comes this level of, of, of policy. And as you say, uh, people being mm. sort of unsure. But uh, again, let's just take a moment to think about the fact that these files and these topics are mm. now in everyone's minds. Uh, exactly. Yes, there's a lot of information, but people have an interest, and that's uh, a huge step up. Mm -hmm. Oliver, you've got uh, a minute as well. To well, thank you very much. Um, I think we need to become better at integrating our strategies and our solutions to transform the building mm. sector to make it really fit for the future and make it fit for the needs of the citizens, mm. because the citizens need to be at the core. I think that's clear. Um, and I'm not arguing for a better integration in order to reduce the importance of one aspect. Energy efficiency is essential. Mm. Renewable heating and cooling is essential. Mm. Climate adaptation is essential, no doubt. But I think if we combine the many drivers, mm. we will have a bigger sum, a bigger total than if we only look at the individual tri drivers and try to optimize them. And then we will really have this transformational renovation wave for the building sector. So integrating policy, making policy thinking would be my key message today. Excellent. Oliver. Uh, Guillaume? Yes, I also wanted to talk about integration, but um, integration of uh, the consumer's pathway to retrofit. Because as mentioned earlier, not everyone is fully convinced, but if you make it the easy choice, uh, you make it uh, accessible, affordable, and visible, not fully straightforward, it's going to remain a hassle. But if you have uh, beacons, clear beacons for people, they will uh, engage in this uh, retrofit project of, uh, of theirs. And another point I wanted to raise quickly is on the distributional effects. We can all call for uh, the retrofit of the housing uh, sector, but keep in mind that the distributional effects are super important. You, we talked about cost optimization, cost of for whom and to the benefit of whom. And that's even uh, t more true for the private rental sector mm. the, between the tenants and the landlords. Scott, you talked about sort of EU vis-a-vis -vis the, the world as well, sort of leading the way and, and helping the rest of the world along. What would you like the EU to take to uh, COP28? Mm -hmm. What mandate and what message? I think a fantastic example that was taken to COP26 was uh, 17 exemplar buildings that demonstrated what's possible. Mm. So I think what the EU could take to COP28 are examples of the possible, because this is what people need to see. But if the EU is going to COP28, it cannot stay in the blue zone. The EU should be going to whatever city COP28 is hosted in. The EU should have satellite projects all around that city. Invite the industry. You need to have not just industry as in people doing the designing. We need to be the people delivering it on the ground. So if EU is going to COP28, it needs to be in the streets. It has to be engaging with civil society. It needs to be an open invitation. And it has to be as public as possible. People need to know it's there. Because I know that in Glasgow, what we had in COP26... Civil society engagement was absolutely incredible, but we also had the Minga and Dejina were invited and hosted by people in Glasgow. And when the EU goes to COP28, it needs to support uh, Global South countries in coming. So that should be part of loss and damages, should be enabling other countries to come. So the EU should be satellite distribution around the city, but also enabling other countries who would not be able to afford to bring delegates to bring those delegates. So that would be... Slightly off topic, but that would be what the EU should bring to COP28. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And with that, we're out of time. Um, I think on my end, it's, uh, you already did an excellent sort of summary, but I think what I'm hearing across here is it's, it's very important. We've got the solutions. It's complicated. But also we have lots of good ideas and actually tools for making sure that we unclog the system, if you like, and move ahead uh, on this agenda. So thank you so much for coming. At least for my end, this has been a fascinating debate. I really like that we have these sort of various different components of the, uh, of the uh, building value chain together. So thank you so much. Don't forget to check out the other sessions that uh, colleagues here are on the podium are doing. And uh, let's give them all a hand.